Hi, I'm Lucy, and in this tutorial, we're going to be having a look at how you can use custom Quake maps inside of your Godot projects using a tool called Trunch Room and an add on called Kyodo. I want to thank all of my Patreons for making this content possible. Now, let's stop playing Quake and let's jump into the tutorial. Trench Room is an open source tool that lets you create custom maps for the 1996 video game Quake. This piece of software is pretty neat because all of its features are fully geared towards making maps. Unlike other tools that also do rendering, compositing, texture painting, 2D animation, video editing, motion tracking, rigging... Trench Room is just for making maps. And I guess you could also use it for basic 3D modeling. Godot is an add-on that lets you import those custom maps into Godot. This add-on also has some extra cool features, like the ability to add PBR materials. Together, these tools create a really powerful and fast workflow. You can use it for games that have a retro aesthetic or for blocking out bigger levels. This workflow is not really suited though for high poly realistic games. In this tutorial, I will go through the installation process, since that can be quite confusing. And after that, I'll also show you the basics of modeling in Transroom. Sounds good? Then well, let's get started. First, you'll need to go to the Trench Room website and get the one that's right for your operating system. Then, you'll need to unzip it somewhere on your computer. It's important that you remember the location where you unzip it, because we're going to need this location later. For step 2, we're going to install the Kyoto add-on. In your project, let's go to the asset library and search for Kyoto. There, you can download it, and once it's downloaded, you can hit install. The importing of the images can take a while due to a bug in Godot 3. But eventually it will finish. Next up, we need to enable the add-on. To do that, let's go into Project, Project Settings, Plugins, and then hit the Enable checkbox. Let's move on to step 3. In Trench Room, if you would try to create a new map, you'll see a massive list of different settings for different games. We'll need to add our own game to this list. We can do that using Kyodo. In your project, let's go into the add-ons folder, then the Kyodo folder, and there's a game definitions folder. And we're going to go into the trench room folder. There you have two files, Kyodo trench room config folder and config file. We need to use the config folder. Let's open it up in the inspector. And here we need to locate our Trench Room games folder. And this is why I needed you to remember where you installed Trench Room, because we're going to navigate there right now. In your Trench Room install folder, there is a games folder. Let's select that folder. And then we can give our game a name and an icon. When you're done with that, you can click export file. It looks like a checkbox, but it's actually a button. <laughs> it's a weird Godot thing. If you look at the output, you can see that it's successfully exported. If we then start Trench Room and hit New Map, our game should now appear in the list. Let's double click on it to create a new map. So, this is Trench Room. It's already created some geometry for us, but let's add some more by clicking and dragging while nothing is selected. Now let's get this amazing piece of art into Godot. Let's navigate to our Godot project folder. And then let's create a new folder for our maps. Let's just call it something like Trench Room Levels. Let's give our map a name. And let's hit save. And we then switch back to Godot. We need to create a Kyoto map node. Let's create a 3D scene. Let's add a new node and under spatial, Kyoto spatial, there is a Kyoto map. The icons will appear when you restart Godot. With our Kyoto map selected, let's insert our trench room level. Let's hit open and then with a the node selected, let's hit full bold. And if everything went all right, it should now appear. Now let's add some textures to our creation. 
Let's go into View, Preferences, and then with our game selected, we need to define the game path, which in this case is our Godot project folder. Doesn't necessarily have to be this folder, but Trend Room is going to look for a folder called Textures in lower case to find the textures that we're going to use. So let's create a new folder called Textures and let's hit Select Folder. I accidentally selected the Textures folder here. So let's go back one step and then select this folder. It needs to be the root directory of our Godot project. Let's hit Apply. And now we're going to need some textures. We have a couple of textures of metal, some bricks, and more bricks. <laughs> These are just simple 16 by 16 textures that I made. I'll drag them into the textures folder. And if you don't have any textures, you can just get an asset pack somewhere or rip them from Minecraft. Sadly, you can't use texture atlases with this workflow. Inside of Punch Boom, we need to go to the Face tab. Then down here in this tiny menu, you need to click Show. And if everything went all right, the textures texture collection should now appear. You can enable them by double clicking on it. It's also good to know that you can create subfolders and these folders will also appear inside of Trench Boom. And we then select some geometry and click on the texture. We can apply textures to them. Let's hit Ctrl S to save our map. And inside of Godot, let's select our Kudo map and let's hit full build again. And your textures should hopefully now appear. Cool. They look a little blurry because our import settings are wrong for the textures. Let's navigate to our textures folder, select all our textures, and then in the import tab, let's set our compression mode to uncompressed and let's disable the filter. On the reimport, you can now see that they look nice and crispy. All the textures do look a little dark, so I'm quickly going to add a directional light to the scene. All right, that looks better. You can override these textures with custom PBR materials. To do this, let's create a new resource within our textures folder, and let's create a spatial material. We need to give our spatial material the exact same name as the texture that we want to override without the file extension. So let's call this spatial material beam. If we then open it up in the inspector, we can tweak some things. Let's reinsert the texture into this material. And let's mess around with the metallic and roughness values to make it a little bit more shiny. To see this material, we need to go into your Kudo map and then hit full build again. There we go. You now have a very shiny metal pixel texture. To make a material more interesting, you can add custom roughness and metallic maps, and you could also add custom normal maps. As an example, I've used normal maps in this map right here. I've used the base color and the normal map on top of that for these metallic surfaces. And for the floor, as you can see, some pixels are hitting more light than others. You can especially see that well on the side of this building. Textures look like this, a base color, and then a hand-drawn normal map on top of that. Another cool thing that you can do is override them with a shader. So instead of a spatial material, let's create a shader material. And this one needs to go through the same procedure of naming it the exact name of the texture that we want to override. Let's create a new shader. And I'm just gonna drop something that I found on the internet on there. If we then rebuild our map, you can see that it does some funky shader things. Yay. With some tweaking, we can make it look a lot nicer. This was listed as frosted glass on videoshaders.com, but it kind of looked like ice. I'll leave a link in the description. Some other practical examples would be this portal that I created. 
it has a relatively simple shader on top of a surface. And another example is this water, to which I added very subtle movements using a shader. 16 by 16 textures might not really be your thing, they might be too small. If you want to work in a higher resolution, you need to go to your Kyoto map and then change the infiller's scale factor. Let's, for example, change it to 32, and it would just be half the size. You would then need to work at a bigger scale inside of your trench boom map. Please let us know in the comments if you know an easier way to do this. Now that you know how the interaction between Kido and Trench Room works, let's have a look at the basics of modeling in Trench Room. We're going to start off very simple. If nothing is selected and you click and drag, you can easily create geometry. Moving around is basically the same as in Godot. You can hold right click and then move around with W, A, S, and D, and Q and E. You can move existing geometry around by clicking and dragging, and you can also use the arrow keys. You can hold Alt and drag to move it on the z-axis. To extend or retract a face, you can hold Shift and hover over a face. And then you can click and drag. You can also hover over edges of faces that you can't see and then extend them. I really love this feature because it minimizes how much you have to move your camera around. You can hold control to select multiple objects and when you move one face, it will move on its own. But when they're at the same height, you can move them at the same time. Next up, let's talk about snapping. There are multiple different grid sizes to which you can snap everything. You can cycle through them by pressing the number keys on the keyboard. You can also use this menu up here. If you then now move a face, you can see that it snaps by increments of 8 pixels. We can also snap it by 2 pixels, or even by single pixels. For now, I'm just going to reset it to 16. Next up, let's have a look at all the tools in the toolbar. The first one is the brush tool. This tool lets you draw a shape on any face. You can click to add new points. You can hold shift and drag up a face, and then you can hit enter to confirm your shape. You can even draw on angled surfaces, which is pretty cool. The next tool in the toolbar is the clip tool. This one is similar to the knife tool in Blender. With the shape selected, you can click and drag on it. Oh, I accidentally had this other one selected. So I can hit escape and select this shape. I need to click and drag on it to make a cut. You can hit control and enter to choose which side you want to keep, or if you want to keep both sides. I'm going to keep this side. If I then hit enter, you can see that only this side remains. You can also cut at angles by dragging the cut points at an angle. To make more complex cuts, we can also add a third cut point. You can then drag that third point around to get the precise cut that you want. Let's undo that for now, and let's move on to the next tool in the toolbar. The vertex tool does what the name implies, it lets you move vertices. If you drag one vertex over another, they will merge. So if we drag it over all these points, they will get merged into one. The next tool is also pretty self-explanatory. The edge tool lets you move edges. <laughs> and you can do the same thing with dragging an edge over another to merge them. And then you also, of course, have the face tool, which, well, lets you move faces. Who would have thought? Next up, we have the rotate tool, which lets you rotate brushes. When I refer to a brush, I refer to a single geometric object. Then we also have the scale tool, which lets you select a face and scale things.
The shear tool is kind of funky, which lets you select a face and then shear a brush along that face. There is a duplicate button, but I usually use the shortcut Ctrl D or hold Ctrl and drag an object. I guess that's just a little faster. The next two tools let you flip a brush horizontally and vertically. Oh, by the way, another thing that's good to know is that you can hold Alt and use the arrow keys to rotate brushes. The last two buttons are Texture Lock and UV Lock. Texture Lock lets you lock the textures of a brush in world space. As you can see, if I move it right now, the texture will stay in a safe place. But when I enable texture lock, it will move with the brush itself. Texture lock lets you lock a texture from scaling. If we move an edge, you can see that the texture stretches out. If we then disable UV lock and move the edge again, you can see that the texture doesn't stretch. Now that we have had a look at all the tools in the toolbar, let's move on to the UV editor window. If you hold shift and click on a face, it will open up the UV editor for that specific face. You can see a bunch of gizmos here. Let's switch it to a different texture so we can see it a little better. As you can see, we can also use it to switch up the texture of a specific face without changing the texture of the entire brush. Let's have a look at all these funky gizmos inside of the UV editor screen. There are also lines on where the texture loops. They will turn red when you hover over them. You can click and drag on these lines to scale it. Or you can use the text inputs down below. You can use it on the X and Y, and you can also click and drag on where these two lines meet to scale it on the X and Y simultaneously. The thing I just accidentally moved around is the origin point. If we move this origin point to somewhere else, I will use that as the origin for rotating and for scaling. If we move it over here, it will rotate and scale from there. If you quickly want to reset the UV changes you've made, you can click these two buttons. The first one is for resetting it to the world origin, and the other one is resetting it locally. So those are the basic features that you need to add it in Trench Boom. Well, let me show you another pretty neat trick that is kind of hidden in the menus. Let's delete our artwork. And then let's create one big shape. And then let's go into edit and then do CSG. Here we can click hollow or hit Ctrl Shift and K. As you can see, it now hollowed out the object and turned every wall into a separate brush. We can change the textures of those walls and easily make rooms this way. That's pretty neat. We can then use the brush tool to create a shape on the wall, extend it outwards, and we also need to extend it inwards so it goes through the wall. Then once again, we can go into edit, CSG, and then subtract. It will then subtract that brush from the other brushes it intersects with. We now have a little window, it's pretty neat, right? <laughs> if you'd like to see a full real-time walkthrough of someone creating a map in Trench Room, I'd recommend that you check out the YouTube channel Quake Builder. He has several different videos in which he teaches you so many cool tricks, and also pretty cool maps, like this spiral staircase, or this tunnel that he created. I just really love this aesthetic. 
It teaches you a bunch of things like how to create the complex shapes and how to nicely apply your textures. If you would like to see detailed tutorials on every single tool inside of Trenchroom, I recommend that you check out the Dump Truck DS. He has a big playlist with 64 videos about how to create custom maps for Quake. Be aware that he also covers things that are specific to creating maps for Quake and are not really relevant to creating maps for your Godot games. The last part of this tutorial has really just been one big info dump. I have a couple more cool things that I want to show you, so let's keep going. What you can see right here is one of the demos that come with the Kyoto add-on. This demo shows you that you can create spawners and buttons right within your trench room map and have them work inside of Godot. All of these demos are included in the add-ons, Kyoto, and an example scenes folder. Here you have three different folders with a bunch of different demos that are all pretty cool. The one I just show you is this one. It also comes with a .map file if you want to have a look at the map inside of Trenchboom. All the demos also come with a readme node that has explanation on what's going on in that specific scene. Manuals, manuals, manuals are pretty neat. And the one for Kido and Trunchroom are no exception. The Kido manual has a detailed explanation on how you can use all those extra features like adding those spawners and adding buttons. And oh boy, the Trunchroom manual is awesome. It's filled to the brim with so many tips, tricks and explanations. I highly recommend that you have a look at it, even if it's just for fun. If you have questions or if you want to show something that you've made using Kyodo and Trenchroom, be sure to check out the Kyodo Discord server. Here are a bunch of people that share their work and talk about Quake and Kyodo related stuff. I hope this tutorial was useful to you. And I want to once again thank all of my Patreons for making this content possible. If you're interested in seeing more, consider throwing some money at me through Patreon. Thank you for watching and I'll see you later. Huh.